Folks, hi, welcome to another episode of A Pint with Shawnee B. Coming to the beginning of February, that dull, drudgery month of January behind us. I was off the booze for most of it, which I do every year so that I don't have to. A couple of housekeeping things. Thank you very much to those of you who have signed up with my Patreon account to support the podcast. A lot more uh, of you did so than I thought or imagined. As some of you know from listening to the podcast before, I've been kind of reluctant to set up a payment system for Pine with Shawnee B. I've always felt it should be free and it will continue to be free. But we have a situation now with the podcasting industry where all of us are trying to club together and come up with new ways that are non-corporate ways that are not all about Rupert Murdoch or Fox or the traditional media of getting paid. Uh, Most of you out there don't expect to pay for podcasts and I kind of agree with you. However, it does cost money to make the podcast. Those costs range from overseas trips. I record most of my podcasts in London. I've got to get a hotel and flights over and There's also hosting charges from the various podcast hosting companies. There's equipment. So it is an expensive program to put together. And the idea of Patreon really is to acknowledge, I suppose, that there are podcasts out there that you get value from and that you enjoy and that you are prepared to give a dollar or two a month to keep going. If you think about it in terms of the newspaper that you buy every day, most of you who do buy a newspaper, be it online with a subscription or in the local news agent, if such things still exist, will pay about two pounds, two euros, two dollars uh, to get your paper. So basically, I'm asking for those of you who can afford to contribute and subscribe to the podcast to pay one dollar or one euro or two pounds per month uh, as an ongoing subscription through Patreon to help fund my endeavors. If you can sign up to be a subscriber to A Pint with Shawnee B at www.patreon.com backslash Shawnee B. And it's pretty self-explanatory how to do it. Just sign up to be a patron. It'll take about three minutes and I would really appreciate that. Okay, on to today's guest. Johnny Jacobs is a 100 mile an hour raconteur. He is a guy who is a lawyer by trade. He's come from the likes of Morgan Stanley and he's chucked all that and decided to try and do something good and beneficial with his talents. Uh, He set up a company called Malawi Mangoes. He ended up going to Malawi. He'll explain why in the podcast and has spent the last, I guess, 10 years of his life trying to work out ways in which enterprise can come to Africa in order to drive growth and reduce further levels of poverty in African countries. So he's something of a specialist in that Malawi Mangoes wasn't a complete success, but Johnny has his own new company with his partner Craig called Longevity, which is really worth checking out. And on the pod today, we talk about really whether Africa and how enterprise capitalism needs to more actively engage in driving economies and economic growth and well-being in the various African countries. We recorded this podcast in a noisy hotel lobby in Shoreditch, so the sound quality isn't ideal, although it does settle down a bit after about eight to ten minutes. Without further ado, I fade in to Johnny Jacobs. Hotel in Shoreditch in London. Johnny Jacobs is an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, but more importantly for me anyway, and what I want to talk about is he's a guy who really believes that enterprise and the public sector, there's a huge gulf between the two, and if we can somehow close that gulf or bridge that gap, we can uh, make people's lives all over the world a better place. Welcome to the podcast, sir. How are you? Thanks very much. Yeah, really good. Thanks, Sean. You're flying to Nairobi tomorrow, are you? Uh, in a couple of days' time, oh. yeah. <laughs> what's, I, what's I can't what's really it? keep up with it. It <laughs> seems to be on the plane a lot. Are yeah. you from London? Yeah, originally. Ah, okay. The best way to do this podcast, I think, is the traditionally, you're probably bored talking about it, but it does, to me, the story of Malawi mangoes frames actually what you're about. Mm. And you actually seem to have you know, stumbled into this with naivety, asking questions, what do I, your, your mantra is, what do I not know, who knows, how can they help me, right? Yeah. Tell me the story about how you and uh, Craig Hardy, your business partner, 
ended up working in the one of I think one of the poorest countries in the world. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the top five, depending you know on anyone's list, depending yeah. on how you're measuring it. Um, I went out to to Malawi originally. I went to see my girlfriend, who was in English but teaching maths out there at the time. I met Craig uh, one Christmas. And he was just one of those, you know, yeah, it was a chat about the universe, but it was really more about, you know, what was he doing there and how he found himself. I was on holiday. Craig was staying out there for a bit. I said, what happened? And he said, basically, I, you know, was working in big corporations and on the marketing side and product portfolio. And he said, and, you know, I just wanted to see what the fuss was about. And I said, that's extraordinary. So we chatted and, you know, had a great holiday and that was basically it. And I was working, I think, at Morgan Stanley at the time. And I got this phone call and he said, if I asked you how many mangoes there are in Lake Malawi, you know, how many trees, what would you say? I said, absolutely no idea. A lot. So it's about four million, give or take. And I said, wow, that is a lot of trees. And he said, well, what if I told you that, you know, none of those trees are commercially farmed, they're just sitting in people's houses and their own little village orchards. And I said, wow, that's a, that's a lot of basically wild trees. And he said, well, what if I told you that 85% of the crop from those trees rots on the floor every year or it falls? And that, for some reason, ignited, I think, an intellectual snobbery. I was just like, what, what do you mean all this? People like mangoes. <laughs> Everyone thinks they're delicious. What yeah. do you mean, you know? People pay money from you yeah. know, my I'm cooking away in my head. I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me. That's literally throwing money away. When he was telling me all this, and I was like, that just offends my sense of common sense. And so he was like, look, we're going to write an email. We're going to write to Innocent. And we're going to ask them if they want fruit from Malawi. And so he wrote <laughs> to info at innocent.co.uk. I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah. And it was Sounds written awesome. in the style of Innocent. So he called it, are you a chief squeezer or diamond geezer? Um, and basically what it said was, hi, we think you're cool. We followed you for a while. You know, you're a decent company. You go about things in a good way. And then we got an email from this guy who was their global head food technologist. And his name is Athanasios Mandis. I know who I'm mentioning it. He's a very good friend and we still do great work with him. And he's quite simply one of those gifted kind of food product problem solvers. And he wrote back and said, look, it's a bit more complicated than that, sweet boys. We don't buy fruit, yeah. bless you. You have to build a factory and pulp it and then yeah. we buy the pulp. But you may not realize that you've raised an interesting question. So if you're serious about it, why don't you come in and we'll have a chat? So Craig and I went into Fruit Towers and they had on the wall a map of the world and they had in it a piece of fruit or vegetable for every place that they sorted some fruit from. So uh, there was literally not one single piece of fruit on the continent of Africa. And we said, wow, that's incredible. Are you telling me you get nothing? He said, no. And I said, why not? And he said, the, the basic two reasons are, they're all market reasons. One, uh, they don't produce the kinds of mangoes that have been tested in our recipes. Where were they taste. getting their mangoes from? India, which is the biggest producer in the world. They do about 60 to 70% of their world's mm. export. And they said, also, it's about consistency. You know, business is harder. And, you know, I need to know that you can deliver that to me mm. consistently, on time, and of the right quality. This was a discussion without politics, without isms and this and yeah. you ought to be doing this so or either way or well intentioned but incredibly impractical understanding yeah. of the world so it was without all of those things and, and we said well look we're really interested in this and we think we can make this happen and, and we've got these varieties and maybe we should test them and he said you, you can test them he said but you know one of the great things about mango tree is that you can graft onto them you can change their personality and then this was corroborated for us a bit later by our in-country Malawian director of agriculture that actually yeah like most trees you can graft and read produce and so we then made like a supposition we went to Malawi we did feasibility we tested the local ones they weren't great to be fair they just were they weren't great so let's blend it let's go to small farmers let's we'll raise money we'll build our own farms and we'll have kind of anchor anchor supply of commercial activity with a more rural supply chain around it and by anchoring those two together we'll be able to you know cross pollinate skills and you yeah. story about Malawi and it's uh, some of the numbers behind it because, uh, because I, I was surprised when I, I heard that Malawi for example had no civil war was quite low on corruption was very beautiful Th there was a lot going for it right yeah I think there is I think there's there's nuances to that though as well I mean, first of all it's beautiful it's also as we say incredibly peaceful yeah but there is this permanent sense of uh, a lack of urgency. And I don't necessarily mean with people in their everyday lives and what yeah. they're doing for a living, but I mean just as a kind of national psyche. It's more of a fact of, yeah, you know what? These things take a long time. You know, in, in Chichewa, there is this saying, and people say pangono, which literally means slowly, slowly. Look, Malawi's got some terrifying numbers. It's got a 90% roughly unemployment rate, and that's in the cities. 
And, you know, the 5%, 10% or the 1%, these guys are not bankers and accountants. They're cleaning toilets, waiting tables in hotels and restaurants. And What's the population of 7 million? About 17 million. 17 million. Yeah. That's it, a lot of unemployment. It has huge challenges. Mm. I think there is a massive disconnection between, you know, what's written in The Guardian about public-private collaboration and the reality of a place where no one has any means by which to feed themselves and their children. The great thing about your case study is the kind of etch-a-sketch element to it that you're you're starting from ground zero yes. of a country. It's so funny that you're saying that. Malawi Mangos was not a successful investment. We didn't do everything right. Outside of the mango, the other crop that we chose, banana, was a colossal failure and, you know, cost us very dearly. Because, as, as I say, I think there is a disconnect mm. between how we would like to think we feel about Africa. But this goes back to the missions. Yeah, we right. go and give them God because that's what they need. Well, exactly. Yeah, By yeah. the way, and it's so funny. I mean, sure, we, I was having a conversation with people about our different aid agencies and which ones they like. The Americans are the ones you get it the best because they're that's trying. It for them. Uh, I think definitely there is an aspect of that for everyone, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Everyone has got, a, you know, has got their agenda. You, know, you have to be grown-ups and accept that that's the case. You don't have to like the agenda. But I think the thing about the Americans that I like is that this is something which has to be driven by us working together with private enterprise. And no, that doesn't mean, you know, Halliburton or, or companies yeah. that do bad things. It's the mission. It's the what are we trying to actually do here. Yeah. Who do you think we're empowering? Um, and our experience with the Americans is, has been very consistent, that they are very focused on sustainability with a little s. We were doing a project for the American government recently and through longevity, our new vehicle. We want to understand what the blockages are to this agricultural economy. If we supported the right things and economy, what can it be? Yeah. And then what are the things that are stopping that happening and how, do they, how much do they cost? Um, and how do we work that out? We were amazed at the way that they were armed with that information. They then themselves went around to the EU, to individual nation states, to the Malawian government and said, right, let's get together. Increasingly, people are realising is that it is about the collaboration. But the notion that they should do nothing because we somehow have some 1970s retained ideological obsession with the fact that it's only the public sector, and by the way, by itself, that can deliver um, economic change. Well, listen, I, mean, I was going to say, you know, someone said the other day... A homeless problem in Ireland uh, that would make some countries uh, blush. Are you against nationalisation? I said... Well, no, I can only say that I've not really seen it work. I mean, show me one that works and I'm interested. Does that mean that I would privatise everything? Absolutely not. That's yeah. ridiculous as well. You know, I grew up in Statues Britain and, you know, I grew up with a dedicated ideological right. And I think now we've got to tilt exactly the other way around. I think part of it is because, you know, we've got people who don't lie. You know, Trump in the US, and we're going in Turkey. And so there's a righteousness amongst yeah. the progressives. And I don't think it's helping us. No. And this is a great example of where... The further to the left you get, you eventually become right. Uh, well, by the way... Or, or something. <laughs> or something. I, I certainly think from a tolerance perspective, yeah. if you've hit the nail on the head, you know, dogma is dogma. I am not in favour of dogma. I don't care if your badge is red and blue, if it's a donkey or an elephant. We are about solutions to civic problems. Sometimes a solution has a moral consequence. Or something. Oh, we're not children. We, we know that, that that must be right. You so know, in, we, so in, in about 1998, I came up with an idea personally. Uh, and it was called PCAP, Poverty Eradication in Africa Through Capitalism. But the idea was that every country in Africa would get its own team. A team from a bank, a team from an ad agency, a team from design, a team from a plastics manufacturer in China, a team yeah, yeah. from a shipping firm. And instead of money changing hands, we would go, for example, work out, you know, a hundred ideas that cost less than two dollars that could make life better in, in Malawi. Yeah. Which, which would be very different to Rwanda and very yeah. different to, you know, Angola. You work out the feasibility of them, and everyone gets a PCAP stamp. We're a member, and you know, of course, you know why it didn't take up, but it's too fucking, it's like a massive spider's web. Yeah, yeah. In charge, right? <laughs> but it was interesting, though, General Electric at the time were very interested in it, because like, yeah. they were going, it needs some sort of organizing principles, and even that was almost gamified because you could yeah. see the team, we were the team who did Malawi, we were yeah, the team yeah, yeah. in Angola who just sat there and did nothing and whatever. Yeah. You know, so there was, there's a germ of an idea in that. You're, the, 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 the Malawi mangoes, and I don't want to spend the whole podcast talking about that because you've spoken about it elsewhere and I'm going to link your great uh, TEDx speech which actually covers oh, cool. it beautifully. But basically what you did is you went in here, and, and the other thing you said about we didn't quite get it right, well you, you're never going to get it right when you go in 
with, with a let's get this done attitude. The likelihood that you're going to hit the street, you're going to write the new book on how to do it. Right? But what you did do was, if I'm not mistaken, you got a factory built, you got people working, I think $500,000, $600,000 worth of salary, which is yeah, yeah. a lot of salary. Yeah, yeah. You got mangoes made, pulped. We sold them to big international to brands, big international you know. Brands. We, yeah, we were doing all right for and a bit. We were do- doing all right. Now, did I hear right that then uh, some other company bought you and then they screwed it up a bit? Is that fair? Or uh, I'm not going to talk about that. No, I, you know, I. When we started, we yeah. received group and we had some incredible friends. And I, and I want to pay great tribute to the guys at Merlin Partners, incredible guys. Yeah. Um, they put together a really strong group of philanthropists and investors. And mm. they're like, yeah, we'll give this a punt. What happened was we'd started our first farm and we'd had some problems with it, with some of the irrigation. But we were doing really well with the small farmers and the mangoes. It was a win. Like We'd grafted 45,000 trees. People were thrilled. We got a really good reaction. Were the Malawians um, surprised? This they were plan? stunned. Yeah. They, well, by the way, they were stunned, and yet at the same time, strangely, you know, <laughs> people were quite bitter. Why did it take other people to come in and do this? And then we were like, it's a pretty fair point, except to say that this is about market, and that's the thing that we constantly get wrong. It's better now, but a lot of our NGOs and agencies is that you can teach someone how to grow a pineapple. Where's it going? Who's buying it? How do they earn money from it? Um, because without that, it's all very well for us to proselytize about you know well-being, which we should and do. Yeah. But these guys haven't got any income. <laughs> But Malawi, I think, has suffered for a long time from just a, we can't do it. Part of that has been political at times. And by the way, I don't think that's different, and I want to be clear, from any other country. I think a lot of countries, including but ones we live in. <laughs> shed loads of cash. Sure. Pumped into that country. An absolute mile of cash. Is the factory still going? Yeah, it's still processing. Oh, well, I mean, limited amount of mangoes now because I think they're going to switch their attention to the other product now? range. It's the same people that own it now. I'm still a shareholder for whatever that's worth. Uh, then my shares aren't worth a lot. <laughs> Did you come out of it under, like, duress or a cloud? What happened? I think we, as part of this story, we couldn't raise the money to do the next bit. And the next bit was a big bit. After the first farm, it was going to be a factory. It's like 15, 20 million dollars. You know, it's not seed capital, it's, it's infrastructure capital. And we just couldn't get a break. We met everyone and they loved it. And the answer was always the same. Come back when you've been doing it for a few years, when it's not a startup. We can't, can't do a startup. Really. When you don't need my money, I'd be thrilled yeah. to lend it to you. Yeah. But I think the problem was is that we had to go to a shareholder that, you know, it wouldn't have necessarily been a natural fit. But, you know, we hit some difficulties and it just wasn't the kind of shareholder that was built to deal with that kind of... We weren't good partners. Pointing back the finger a little bit at Coke and, and the big brands that you were supplying, did they not see... Look, oh, I think they... Getting... Yeah, no more. I mean, they did. Look, there's an incredible book, which I, by the way, I think you find really interesting. It's called Changing the Food Game. and It's by a guy called Lucas Simon. And it's about how our supply chains evolve over time. And you go from an incredibly uh, private environment where everyone's hoarding their own stuff and their own information. And, you know, then there are commonalities in supply and people grow together and you get trade associations and suddenly people are solving problems. And I'm saying all of that partly to like your question, but partly to say, look, when we were there, we had an incredibly strong relationship with Coca-Cola and a very strong relationship with Pepsi. Yeah, Indira would have been all over that, wouldn't she? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think after we left, uh, you know, after we left, and by the way, you know, our, our whole bit of the management team was fired by this difficult shareholder yeah. um, who weren't really getting what they wanted. You know, when all of that happened, people still try to remain committed to the Coca-Cola relationship, but I think with respect to the others, they were kind of allowed just to fall by the wayside. Yeah. So did all the Malawians go, no? Well, the problem was is that the person brought in to replace us ended up to be, you know, himself a bit of a charlatan. Um, has paid you know hundreds of thousands of euros to deliver a business plan in six months and at the end of four months took the money and said sorry I'm not going to do that but by which point a lot of damage had been done but yet again another African country (laughs) 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 you know that's that's part of it the one thing that is amazing is is that you know the the guys are going to get a refinance away new owners new investments new partners um, super good team and I think there's a real chance that they're going to make it. They're going to probably well, pivot. Well, I suppose if nothing the else, which you've proved is that, lads, all that food that's rotting there, yeah. you know, your very first idea, yeah. actually, when you had lunch with Craig, Yeah, 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 exactly. At least they go, yeah, fuck, we shouldn't be letting all this rot. Yeah, yeah. that um, you can do stuff. That's exactly right, by the way. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I want I, I, I to just talk a little bit wider then about... Um, well, for, sorry, first of all, finish with, with where you went and what longevity is about. 
after we came out of that experience, you know, incredibly you lose stressful. loads of money in it. Uh, yeah, by opportunity cost. Right. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we were using other people's money, there's no yeah, question. Yeah. But we quit our jobs and moved ourselves at our yeah, expense. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, you know, and we, we put everything we had, which is not a lot, but it was everything to us. Um, so it was shitloads to us, I guess, because yeah, yeah. it was all we had. But I think that when we came out of it and, you know, we took a few months, but we'd already had the idea of longevity because of our experience. We'd already talked yeah. about it. We'd already talked about the notion that the problem was is that public and private doesn't talk to each other properly. And rather than bemoan that as a, as a campaign, let's understand, again, it's Craig and Johnny, let's understand why, why is it? And the reason why, maybe unsurprising, is they literally don't speak the same language. Correct. They do, but they don't realize that literally some of them, they mean the same thing, yeah. but they're just not using the words that they yeah. understand. And they're suspicious of each other. And that doesn't help, because then when they're not understanding each other, they're also, what's he really trying to say to What's their angle? Yeah. What are they really trying to get? You can always tell that in that environment. Yeah. We felt that there was a great opportunity to, because we really understood, we come from a private enterprise background mm. and we think it has to work that way around, by the way. I kind but, of agree with you. Yeah. But we have a deep understanding and, and passion for properly managed, properly directed public sector. Um, so we felt we could speak to these. And as it turns out, I think we were right. And we said, look, let's do three things. Let's say that one, we want to work with the public sector in areas where it's going to support the commercialization of its economies mm -hmm. and nowhere is that more true than Malawi because it's an entirely age-driven economy you know in a country where no one's had a war that's one of the unfortunate consequences you know in countries where people everyone is killing each other aid money pours in and it's all directed at infrastructure and business and building the country up and in Malawi we don't do any of that yeah. we put okay. money into yeah. consultants to talk to you about yeah. you know why your health policy should be changed yeah. and you know we, we teach people how to grow pineapple but don't give many market for it we just we when, need to when spend you say public policy do you include ngos in that charities yeah and i that? do i don't listen i don't i'm not into the dogma yeah. right i don't think all charity is bad i don't think NG, all the ngos yeah. bad i think there are some it's certainly my experience in haiti ah. because there were too many ngos and Look, they were, couldn't get out of each other's way well i think that's true but i think the other problem is is that there is a strong movement in malawi for the fact that the ngos are the, the conscience of the voice who have got the right to suggest how this will work and and i'm afraid that's been a problem for a long time i think ngos have got some fantastic roles to play i don't think they should run businesses i have to say i think one of the reasons ngos and people have stepped into that breach is because certainly in the 1970s in that kind of era businesses weren't operating as progressive businesses but yeah. you know what now there are you know it's not just johnny and craigs you know there are people we employ there are angelas there are malawians mm. Um, particularly women, by the way, who so, want to get on with it. So one, your, your longevity, number one, help the public sector to move towards... Yeah, that's one of the things we like to do. We want to advise people yeah. on that. Okay. We also want to help the private sector on its diversification. And we're very interested in that kind of strategy in sub-Saharan Africa. That's box number one. That's yeah. advisory, I would okay. call it. Right. Then you've got box number two, which is, look, we want to help money find good enterprise. Right. We know that there's an entire industry of deal flow but we also know that no one's happy with it. You speak to any investor about Africa, they're like, listen, we've got money, but I've got nothing to spend it on. This stuff isn't, in fact, none of this will stuff will pass muster. And we, because of our network and our environment, well, we know a lot of deals and businesses, which could really, or great businesses, could do really well. They won't make it to a, a business plan in Actis because no one's got the money to, to spend a hundred grand on it. But maybe they'll spend 10 or 15 or 20. Let's help people raise money and let's help money find the people and transactions that it really yeah. want and we thought we'll build a whole load of services where, you know we'll, we'll look at companies if you want us to go and do some diligence on whether we think it's a good company so if you imagine us as like a venture capital firm but really more of a club right we've got a club of investors who like stuff and we help show them yeah. the way and we'll earn some money from that and also there's businesses and enterprises public and private that we can advise yeah. but then there's a third bit we're going to run some of these businesses. Some of these are going to be ours. To We're be not to. trying to be a venture capital fund. We don't want 100 investments of which, you know, 70 are rubbish. We'd like seven or eight, we believe, critical investments, all in food production, good quality production, good transferable skills, good ad value, good ad market, you know, that really demonstrate what we demonstrated at Malawi Mangoes. Whatever happens and what everyone says, you can do it. In five years from nothing, yeah. we built something you know, you remarkable. That's the other point. You did it in five years. You can it, do it. What strikes me, and again, just referring back to that PCAP idea that I had, which was, it strikes me that because you've been brave enough to go in there, 
and actually not just talk but do and almost succeed almost You're very close You're pretty close yeah. and you have all this research it strikes me that there could be like a global project Malawi yeah where yes Coke or yeah. Pepsi one of you but pick an ad agency group or an, yeah. and a design company and a, and a VC company and a transport come together mm -hmm. and say and test your theory and yeah. say now you're walking back in there with the heft mm -hmm. of big big corporations and what's in it for them well you know what here's a template well it's interesting and uh, companies love fucking templates yeah I mean on the one hand I mean, you know, there's, there's a part of me which massively objects to that because right. one of course one of our problems in Africa is that we try and cut and paste or cookie yeah. cutter these things yeah. or whatever on the other hand what I can tell you and I can't say too much about it is sure. that what you're describing is one of the things we're actually working okay. on at the moment okay. led by one of the biggest brands in the world okay. and potentially supported by other brands who are interested in some supply from them on a yeah. giant scale because I think you're right going back to why it offended our sensibilities in the first place and why we wanted to solve these problems is because, look, we need more food and we need more food-related stuff. It's not just a question of political conscience to say, and we're running out of space because we're being such bad people. Yeah. We are, and we are. Yeah. But none of that changes the maths. We need more food and we need to grow it more sustainably. Again, little s. Yeah. I, I had think, a guy in my podcast with which he talks about future in, in modern homes is going to be hydroponic walls where we will go 100% absolutely no question and by the way again, you're going to have a home biogas you're going to have a home biogas system to go with that yeah. uh, I know some people making home yeah. biogas systems in Israel it's incredible yeah. by the way these things are all coming we want to make sure that these economies and these enterprises take their rightful place in that because this is the opportunity we've got the internet now we, we, we've got the ability to communicate Africa has resource infrastructure and governance that's advantage, no question, and that's what we're here for. Are the Chinese all over you as well? No, not at all. One of the things I they think is, yeah, and they're all over Malawi as well, but not in the way that they are in Tanzania right. or Kenya uh, or Nigeria. And the reason for that, by the way, is because, ironically, that China's in Africa for a very simple reason. It's the same reason it's everywhere, market. And Malawi's a tiny market, <laughs> so ironically for the moment, and it's incredibly poor. I think the Chinese have this interesting approach, though, which is, it is also slightly pan-African in the sense that it's a very different kettle of fish to America, and I've lived, yeah. in, both, I've lived in both places. But the Chinese, there seems to be a sort of a, we will be thanked in the future and respected in the future if we go in and plow yeah. infrastructural uh, stuff in, and no one else is and we can create relationships that no one else is because actually of what you just pointed out. Yeah. People can make a hundred and one excuses as to why not to invest in any African country. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's right. From the weather yeah. to the fact that there's corruption, to the fact there's no infrastructure, whatever. Mm. But no one's going in and actually saying, well, okay, if there's no infrastructure, let's fix the infrastructure. Yeah. I'm not saying no one is, but no. it's happening at a snail's place. Funny enough, and that's, by the way, it, it's interesting because you keep looking, that's the other thing, that's actually one of the things I'm doing in London at the moment is I'm working with a group of fantastic people to develop a targeted infrastructure fund and when I say targeted I mean for exactly that reason it's yeah. to say look and this is the longevity story so it's we'll have an advisory bit we will have an operational bit and we'll have an investment bit yeah. and we'll move between those things and our only test at longevity is one test the thing we are involved in whether whichever part of it is it's our keep us honest test Whatever we're involved in, it has to be something which is going to move the needle. And move the needle for us means, in a hundred years' time, would I look back and see the seeds of something in where I am now in the development of this thing? And by the way, that doesn't necessarily have to be some new secret formula. It could be a bridge or a road to a which place I, or a business I would say park. Malawi Mangoes has passed that test. For sure so we felt it anyway, did. Yeah. For sure we felt it did. Let's move out of, we've only got ten minutes left, let's move out of Africa and move back to the Western world where we all yeah. reside. Can the Western world, the way it's going, ever hope to achieve these aims? Sure. I'm a, I mean, I, You're a glass half full. Guy. I'm a glass half full person. I'm glass is half full because, in a nutshell, for whatever awful, despicable things we can do to each other, and we do plenty, we're also part capable of greatness um, and great compassion. And I think it's quintessentially human to always struggle with these things. And I think, unfortunately, it is our way. We tend to really make life very difficult for ourselves right before we make it better. Darkest and, hour is the hour before we Yeah, go. and I think unfortunately, if we have a 60, you know, we have a 60 year snapshot of our consciousness, really, at the, at the top of our game, right, if we're lucky. 
unfortunately we are only able to measure progress in that snapshot we can't we can't look into the next we can't experience the next not really and as a result of that this all feels very slow and frustrating to us because it is it's the only way we can experience it however being Irish and being away for 21 years when I came back wow must have been incredible well it wasn't no the the same five major problems yeah 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 were still the same five major problems so maybe this is what I'm saying this is 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 what I like about this there's no doing and there's no creativity. Yeah. There are two of my problems. The others are homelessness, education, and, and health, which I've talked about on the, on the podcast many times before. But the, sure. there's no creativity. You have that. There's no doing. Get up off your arse and do it. There's talk. I mean, we have a homeless thing that's been an, an emergency for 10 years. Yeah. The government had a huge meltdown about, is it in fact an emergency? I spent a whole day talking about whether or not it was an emergency or not. You know? Unbelievable. Meanwhile, 10,000 people are... are well, totally are, believable, are unfortunately. Homeless. These things are very frustrating, and I think when you're someone who is want to be extremely careful, because you know, I always say to people, I don't think you need to get up and go and live in Africa. It's exactly what you're saying. Stay yeah, where you are do and do something. Do well a, 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 them, yeah. Yes, and, and enjoy it and like it, and you know, be loving to people. You know, just yeah. live your life, live your life there, and live it to your full. I'm thrilled about that. I totally support yeah. that. As you say, I feel like we're just. You know, when I come back here to England, I'm just God. I'm not really trying. Now, maybe that's just because I'm in a place where your trying has so much impact. I mean, I know that when I left here in the UK, one of the reasons I left, right or wrong, was I was just like, you know what? Don't you dare say to me that people are apathetic. That implies that they don't care. It's not that people don't care. It's that they just think, and they're right, that, you know, here in the United Kingdom, caring has no value. And I don't just mean caring, I'm just, it doesn't matter if you give a shit. It's so hard to change fundamentals here. But maybe there's the concept, though, that at a very individual level, we all care really much. Yeah. Uh, but as a sort of even about other people, as, a, as an anomalous mass, yeah. maybe not so much. Or as a you know, came back. Yeah. One of the other things before you leave that those Go other things was this this issue of the brands again, because like the homelessness is now apparently an emergency. No, it is an emergency. But I did a I did a review of all of the home insurers, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. About their CSR. Yeah. And, and they do autism and they do yeah. this and they do that By the way, and they that's do really interesting. Tea, tea for the you know people sure with Alzheimer's and now none of them are doing homelessness now their business only survives if they have a home to insure what if the insurance companies said and the banks because they got us into this in the first place said we believe everyone's a constitutional right to a home in Ireland, and we're going to try yeah. and help fix it enterprise coming in with so government. interesting by the way and you know but the point the reason they haven't done it it's no it's no genius go oh we should they've thought about it and chosen someone's not chosen to. not to yeah. and this is what makes me sick because this is like and, and they're slagging enterprise and say enterprise is to roll up their sleeves yeah i suppose this is the venn diagram that longevity is trying to fill here right yeah but who, who could we go to to help us do that well because One company because you know what sean and you might be surprised that i say this I'm not sure there is a conscious mind necessarily in the way that you mean it that has said we could do that but we're not going to I think it's a little bit more subtle than that I think there are brand agencies and strategists and they tend to think around a certain way and the first thing is what's not new that's the first thing is I don't want to go and spend lots of money on something that's new I want to spend some money on something I know will work and I think there's always that tension. But my view is the banks and insurance companies get such a bad rap from everybody that they go, oh, here you come trying to do Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. Maybe. You know, screw you. But I think it's a bit like just roll up the sleeves and go wading into the emergency. I think that's true. But I guess, and, and that's why I think you're right. That mm. is the space longevity you're trying to say. Because what we're trying to say is, is a minister side or, or irritation aside, we think part of your problem is, is that you're not really talking about something that could be a real solution. Have you considered, you know, someone you trust or someone who speaks a language that you trust yeah. to say let's talk about this differently yeah. so you know a lot of the language we use when we deal with the private sector and public sector in when we're looking at Malawi or other projects is let's talk about opportunity cost let's literally talk about this in terms of money you want to talk about money and budget let's talk about it let's talk about what it really would be worth to you if we did this differently because and then let's talk about the risk is a risk of different well let's talk about what that risk is and by the way how do you measure risk of something new against something which you know isn't working yeah. <laughs> right so yeah. I think what we're trying to do is sit in that place and say guys let's not worry about having a conversation and what we do is we pull in real experts in their field you know we've made our mistakes sometimes thinking we knew a little bit more than I think we did we're not going to make that mistake again and really get the smartest minds around the table 
Or, or naive is the attempt. No, yeah. make the attempt. Yeah. But, you know, give yeah, yourself like the best you shot. You had a go and then you go, why did that fuck up? Let's see if we could do it better. Yeah. The next By the time. way, do you know what's funny is, and, and this I don't mind saying, to this day, no one, not one single shareholder, no one left, no one remaining at Malawi Mangoes, nobody asked us what we thought went right or wrong. No one ever has. Yeah. Extraordinary, no? Yeah. Anyway. So, Brexit, etc. Thoughts outside? Actually, well, I've got a good question for you. If you... Sure. If I could give you one wish, you're not allowed to ask for a million wishes. <laughs> Great shout. No, literally was uh, there. <laughs> if, you, if I gave you one wish to change something fundamental about the world, what would it be? We have built for ourselves very clever systems which we take faith in. I'm a, I'm a free marketer, I'm not an anarchist. And as a free marketer, it doesn't make sense to me that there are five dudes who set the cost of money. That's not a free market. It's the very definition of a not free market. It's not conspiratorial, because I don't think it's a conspiracy. It's not anarchy, because I don't think the result is anarchy. But I think we have found great comfort in things which are not delivering for us. And because those things are institutionalized, and by the way, the media is a great example. And it fights like the darkest of the dark to protect its position. And by the way, that's also not conspiracy. It's called humanity. That's what we do. We defend our status quo. And I think it's the single greatest thing holding us back. I so think. what would the answer be? I, I'm talking about stop, the full-scale genetic wor- reprogramming. Yeah. No. <laughs> you would stop worrying about... Explore, explore, explore listen, yeah. we're human, go over the hill, we've got this, fire, I'm going to leave the cave, kind of, you know. Is this Jordan Peterson kind of, yeah, well, you want, oh. that, you want, you want Marxism? We know that didn't work. I'm mean, like, yeah, we know <laughs> no, Marxism didn't yeah, work. Right, so we'll just give but up. Is- I've got great news for you. Capitalism in the form that we yeah, thought it was also has not worked. Yeah. You want to rock around, yeah. right? So what we're saying is, is that argument has been always about dogma. It's about the ism. It's about the club. It's about the badge. It's about the party. That's all bollocks. And I think this generation of people are really starting to realize that that's all bollocks. And it's not anarchy to say that. No. It's about next. It's we're ready for next. And I think next is a more thoughtful. We just had two referendum, one on Scotland, in Scotland, and one on, you know, on membership of the European Union. Wow, that is a reaction to an assault on our public discourse by everyone, yeah. right? Because you know what? It's not true, the old adage. You don't have to worry about whether you're picking a fight with someone who prints ink by the barrel because screw them. They're not the ones who we're reading. And those smart ones are now online. That is changing everything. And I think, by the way, it's going to produce some horrific results. It's going to yeah. produce Trump and analytics and, and all these things because that's I our mean, what nature. We're looking for is a new ism. Yeah, and that's, by the way, the thing that I would like to... If I could start unprogramming us from isming ourselves, yeah. that would be my wish. Yeah. Because when we look at a problem and look for the answer, we are at our very best. When we do it because our club requires us to look at it through this lens, mm. and that might be the right lens, don't get me wrong, but the club told us it's a rule of the club that you have to look through this lens, that doesn't sound like an att- approach to problem solving in a world of billions and billions of people. Well, you know, I think it was uh, Deng Xiaoping who said that in order to get to, to, to socialism the way it was intended, you must first pass through capitalism. Yeah. The thinking of you know, Marx was hijacked by capitalists because they go, fuck, we've got to look after the workers, we've got to change things yeah. a bit here. Y- yes, billions died. That's, we don't want that. Yeah. But I can't understand why we don't look more to the social democracies of Scandinavia, which, which have their problems as well. But you know that there's, there's their high power. Yeah, you do. You know why? Because they're different. I mean, I know yeah, they look yeah, like yeah. us, but they're different. Yeah. English people don't look at you know, people from Norway and Things say, like I'm like you. approach to prisons. Approach to sexuality, yeah, but by the way, I think, equality. but Sean, I think we are different because I have to say, I don't think those approaches would necessarily work yeah. in other Anglo Saxon or other communities. Yeah. I think they work there, and, and by the way, I think that's the message you have had an honest enough conversation with yourselves to find something that actually is universally popular and works in your country, which by the way is unheard of yeah. popular and works. Maybe that's the answer. Um, by the way, I don't know necessarily whether in today's Britain that that would necessarily produce answers we like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this, yearning, <laughs> this yearning for the good old days of which there were. Of none. what good old days yeah, are you exactly referring to? You know, the Black Death, yeah. or you know, have I gone back too yeah. far? The crisis <laughs> of the 70s. Yeah. My, my trademark question when I leave a guest go is what would you say to your younger self if you had to go back and speak to him? I didn't even talk about your childhood, I presume it was fine, but. Do more maths. 
really? Do more maths. Really? I love maths now, but it's something that I hated for a really long time, and then I loved again, but literally as I hit 30. I think I'd have really enjoyed to do more with it. I, I have this rule, which is that I wouldn't say anything to my younger self. I'd ignore me because I'm very... I know who I am and I'm comfortable with it and I wouldn't want anything. So I wouldn't want to go and change anything. I wouldn't regret anything. Yeah, I, I would say don't say anything to your younger self. Watch and maybe try and learn some things again for your later self. Yeah. <laughs> it might be. Johnny Jacobs, the uh, company's name is Longevity. I wish you all the best with yourself and Craig. It was great chatting to you. 100 miles in our conversation. The two of us can certainly yap for England and Ireland. <laughs> a tournament. That was great. <laughs> Look after yourself. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me on. Yeah.